they'd cut their hair, they'd beat them, they would not allow them to you know, speak their language. And that was the policy of these institutions is just to kill every essence of, of natives, right? And literally tell, brainwash these kids like, you are bad, you are evil. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Visit betterhelp.com slash Padilla because sometimes existing is exhausting. And if you wanna watch this episode with no ads, no sponsorships, completely uncensored, click the join button down below to become a member and support this channel. Anyway. Hello, Crystal. Hi. Hello, Ty. Hi. What does it mean to be Native American? Transformer to a werewolf. Yeah. Six pack abs. Of course. The usual mm -hmm. goodies. Did you always know about your cultural roots? I very much was always aware of my cultural roots, but I very much remember when I was like four or five, uh, we had like a powwow with like uh, regalia at our youth center. I went home, I was like, wow, like there's Indians there. And she's like, no, we are. I'm like, I know, I know we are, but like, they're like real, real Indians. And then quickly uh, got a lesson learned. <laughs> That's like, there is no such thing as real, real because we are all real, real. It's so weird though. It's like when you're a child that age, you're watching television, you're watching movies and you're so just heavily influenced by what you see on TV that like even at that young of an age, like literally being my own race, I, I just didn't click at that point. Data suggests that upwards of 80% of Americans know nothing about Native people. Native Americans always seem to be invisible. We were never included in the data, you know, it's like, we just, it was like we didn't exist. And if we did, then we're just like a caricature, a mascot, right? We're an inanimate object, like a Jeep Cherokee or something. Mm. And so I started, uh, co-founded a project called the Reclaiming Native Truth Project, which was a $3.3 million project. It was like the largest research project ever done of its kind. And it was just really about asking key questions, like what are the dominant narratives and perceptions that Americans have in this country about Native peoples? Mm. And in terms of those narratives and perceptions, how do they influence the way people think about Native peoples, decisions, you know, that are made about Native peoples, and how do we, how do we change that? Most Americans aren't sure if Native peoples exist anymore. When you type in Native Americans into Google, mm -hmm. that more than 90% of those images, um, you know, come back pre-1900. Do you remember the last time that you learned about Native Americans in school? Yeah, it was maybe fifth grade? 87% of schools in the entire United States don't teach about Native Americans past 1900. So that explains mm. it, right? And like most people, it's like you, they learned about it maybe in elementary school, maybe a little bit of middle school. And what little's taught is taught by, you know, it's the, it's the history of the, of the conqueror of the United States. So it's taught whatever you're learning in school is typically, you know, the white man's sort of lens of, of how we defeated Native uh, Americans. Like right? the, the imperialist comes, yeah. they, they see the native people, uh, some stuff happens that we don't talk about. And then now it's- Right, we don't oh. talk about genocide, no. right? Did you learn about genocide? No, yeah. <laughs> hi, hi ten, 10 year olds. <laughs> so uh, you're on land that was stolen and many, many, many people were killed. All right, now let's do the acorn math. Yeah, right? yeah. let's, yeah, let's learn how to make that. Right, and so nobody's really learning the history that when we walk around all over this country, yeah, it's steeped in blood. It's it's stolen land. It it came by murdering native peoples, but nobody talks about it. What was your life like growing up? on the reservation. What is it like growing up on a reservation? It's your every other town, I don't know. Uh, it doesn't seem specifically like, oh, that is a reservation, like from the outside looking yeah, in, you Yeah, I mean, the stop signs are in Mohawk, they're not in English. Um, there's some little things you could see. Um, a lot of dogs without leashes, <laughs> but that's, oh, yeah. you know, res dogs, mm. literal show. I don't know, it's it's community, and I've, I've never not felt safe at home, and I feel like I have this sort of like, really ironically picturesque Hollywood childhood because I spent most of it on my bike with my friends or, uh, you know, staying out till the sunsets, like all these like cliche small town things. Mm. It just happens to be on a reservation. Everyone just happens to be native. Right. Um, and that was my upbringing, yeah. I think, I think when people hear reservation, they think that it looks like the pictures that people see of like 1800s tribes. Oh yeah, I've had someone like ask me if it was okay to like drive through the reservation to go somewhere and I was like, like, yeah, you're on the highway. Like the highway just happens to go through it. Yeah, like, you're gonna stop on the highway, signs. like it's fine. <laughs> yeah. um, someone's like expecting like bow and arrows with their car. I grew up watching Hey Arnold. And like, <laughs> you know, I, I, I grew up going to movies, going to concerts, going to Warped Tour. I very much had the modern life. There's this love, at least in the past, for like the sad stoic Indian, mm. um, which I think 
helped with these stereotypes of what it is to be near person, what a reservation looks like. Reservations are communities. They're, uh, their homes, their uh, family. I really see reservation as just like, um, I don't know, a strange name on it because it's like, we haven't left our homelands, you know? We're still sitting where we used to sit. Was there a time when you re- like felt like you were being treated differently? I mean, I think as a kid, you know, I mean, it was one just, you know, my last name's Echo Hawk, so it was just terrorized through school. People um, tease you for that? I oh, think that's God. a badass last, that is one of the <laughs> most badass last names ever. You know, kids, they're little shits, like, yeah. you know, like being bullied and chased through the hallways and people going Echo, Echo Hawk, Hawk. And, mm. and I think most kids not having a context, like why do you have such a weird name, you know? Thankfully, people think it's full now. <laughs> yeah. You know, high school, college, it just always had to deal with like idiot professors and teachers that made fun of my name. Or if we were studying Native Americans, they would just tell me to get up and teach the class. I had, I had a teach, I had, when I was a sophomore in high school, I had my, my history teacher did that. He said, get up and you're going to teach the class today because you're Native American, you know everything, right? And I was 16, I was like mortified. I was born right around the time of the Oka crisis, which is a historical event that happened on my reservation and other Mohawk communities in Canada. It was basically like our communities versus the Canadian government. And it's a similar situation that happens to many reservations, Standing Rock very famously here, um, that... People just don't seem to understand that, like, stop building stuff on our sacred, like, lands. There are actual laws and treaties around these things that were signed 300 something years ago in our favor, but people tend to forget that. From what I know, it sounds like a lot of those treaties were created and immediately broken. Not saying those that yeah. one specifically, but many have been. Broken treaties, yeah. It's yeah. It is a recurring statement. I think that's why I keep coming back to, like, the, like, I don't know, the punk, of all nature, protest heart that I have with all of these issues. Cause um, yeah, we didn't leave, like we're still here. It feels like there must've been a sense of, well, you say this or yeah. you sign the paper, so this'll happen. And then we, we see through all the research that you've done <laughs> that those were tactics used to, to get the land without necessarily giving back or, or having that balance. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, what people need to understand is that every single treaty that, you know, when Native peoples had to sign it there, oftentimes there was like, you know, there was language in there is like, as long as the grass grows and the river flows, these promises, like whatever we're promising in exchange for this, we're gonna do, and they, they broke everything. Red Cloud, which was a very famous Lakota chief, you know, apparently he said, um, they broke every promise but one. And the one that they kept was that they said they were gonna take our land and they did. When did you start learning about the erasure that, that's that been occurring with your culture? I used to come home after school and just turn on the TV and watch cartoons when I was in elementary school. And um, did you ever watch Bugs Bunny? Yes. Okay, Elmer Fudd. Were there some cliche like there caricatures of, of Native Americans <laughs> yes. in that? The horrible, like the horrible stereotypes, but I'll never forget watching it. One of the biggest, you know, stereotypes about Native Americans is that we're all alcoholics. In watching that show, it was like kind of Wild West setting, but then all of a sudden this big Native American man with a big red nose, right? Like he'd been drinking, came walking across, but he was wearing a sash that said Vanishing American. And I remember he just walked across the screen and with Elmer Fudd and Bugs Bunny, he just disappeared. And I remember that was the first time I was in third grade and I thought as a, as a native person, just as a kid, just trying to even understand my own identity, it was like, what is that? Why, why are they calling us Vanishing Americans? And it stuck with me forever. And so, you know, I guess my, my career started in third grade <laughs> in some ways, like some kind of, you know, perception about this is really wrong because mm. we're still here. To me, the cultural erasure of uh, indigenous native people in this country, I think it, it it's it's on purpose. It, it helps drive the narrative that we're not here anymore. And then I think once uh, folks realize we're not leaving, uh, we're still here, you start seeing things in pop culture itself come up and I'll be at the wrong way. Like I'm thinking of like the spaghetti westerns of the 40s and 50s. Um, people fall in love with like the cowboy and Indian aesthetic and mm. it's like, Everyone wants to be native, like only when it's cool um, and don't want to take any of the shit. So let's talk about the the uh, native portrayal in media. Yeah. So that's, that's one thing that you mentioned to me is that the way that native people are portrayed is not accurate. No. So how are they portrayed <laughs> and what is the reality? I always joke that like the closest thing I had to a native role model growing up was the Indian in the cupboard. 
Oh um, yeah, actually, I think that was the first time I ever heard about a native person in, in media. <laughs> and I specifically said it was a native role model only because I was like, I mean, that Indian's gay. Yeah. I'm like, I, uh, he's I he's mean, in a cupboard. He comes, he's comes coming out, comes out the cupboard when he comes when he yeah, feels I mean, comfortable. A plus B equals C. Yes. Um, yeah. There's so many wild, wild ideas of like native and media, and I feel like now that we have incredible cool shows. Uh, really breaking up the door, Rutherford Falls, Reservation Dogs, Dark Winds, Kid Show, Spirit Rangers. Um, media as a whole starting to say like, oh, like there's there's other things. And and other cool parts of the native media growing up uh, that I loved was um, Wednesday Adams in Adams Family Values when she does the play, which mm. is horribly racist in itself, but they completely um, inverted the trope. And it was such an F you moment. Yeah, because the they film. were aware of it. They were it. aware <laughs> of it. And she turned the play around and like she took the power. And so I was always like native, like Wednesday is honorary native in my books. Indian is different than Native American, right? Or Yeah, I mean, I, Indian is a term that is used very much from the generation before me. It's, it's a point of conflict within the native community as well of like, what do we label ourselves as? Right. And I'm sort of in the headspace of, of like, if you're native, it's like amongst natives, like, Call yourself whatever the hell you want. You can say whatever you want. Yeah, yeah, because it's it's you know we're at home, we're lounging. But th did the term Indian really come from people like Columbus thinking that they were traveling all the way around the world and then landing uh, on the Americas and thinking that I they're Indian people? Because that's what I so. heard. I mean, I'm like I don't see any other way. Uh, yeah, that's kind of that's wild, right? It's like an wild. entire millions of people were called the wrong thing. It was the first stereotype. Mm. It was incredible. I don't know Columbus. Oh, uh, you don't know him? Oh, but, shit. Um, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if he's a big old dummy. Yeah. <laughs> a few years ago, I took an ancestry test, yeah. DNA, DNA test. Yeah. And I was really surprised when I saw I am 9% Native American. Okay. And it's really strange because growing up, you know, I my last name is Padilla. So yeah. it was like, oh, your grandfather is Spanish. But even in our family, we never talked about that part of our history. Yeah. We only talked about where our last name came from. Mm -hmm. I almost feel like a part of my identity has been erased in some sense. Exactly. Sense. You know, I think a lot of people are in your position. Yeah. And to your point, like, how did that part of you get erased? And, and I how think, do I support it? What do I do? Like, yeah, what do you do? Like... What do you do? I mean, I think the biggest thing is, is like to go do the research, right? And then as you kind of start to figure out where your family was, you can literally do a, a map and an overlay and start to figure out what tribes are right there. Mm. I mean, a lot of times though, because of colonization, because of that erasure and kind of forced relocation and in a variety of different conditions, they lost track of where they were from. And mm. so they don't know either. And I think that's a lot of people in this country, but with some good research, I think you could probably figure it out. Was there any erasure in your family? Or? My grandfather was um, sent to a boarding school. He was taken away from his family when he was little. That was the whole federal government policy was to take Native American kids away from their families, send them to these institutions, oftentimes, sometimes really far from home. They'd cut their hair, they'd beat them, they would not allow them to you know, speak their language, they made them learn English, they couldn't practice their culture or their spirituality anymore. Or they'd get beat? Yeah, exactly. There was tons of sexual abuse in these institutions, psychological abuse, physical abuse. You know, many of these institutions were run by churches like the Catholic Church. It was all a big, gigantic policy of the United States government. And the reason they did it, it was like so cold-blooded, it was a political military policy to take the kids and start breaking up families and tribes in order to get the land. And more than 100,000 Native American children were removed from their families and sent to these institutions and many never made it home. And that was the policy of these institutions is just to kill, kill every essence of, of natives, right? And literally tell, brainwash these kids like, you are bad, you are evil if you practice anything about who you are and white is the only thing that's good. They beat the culture and a lot of it out of him. And, you know, I remember a few years before he died, just he would sit down and he would try to remember words and he'd write them down, Pawnee words, right? And just anything he could try to remember. But it, that's what I remember about my grandfather in the last few years of his life was just, I think, that longing to, to have that language and that culture back. And so as kids in my family, we didn't grow up with it at all. Mm. So it was really later in life as I became an adult that I purposely was like, I want to know more about who I am. So I, right. I, I moved to our reservation so I could learn more. There's not a Native American in this country who hasn't been 
like impacted by the boarding schools because all of some, if you go into every one of our families, someone was taken and put into those institutions and things, bad things happened, like they were beaten. And so this is a part of history you're not taught about. Did you learn about it in fifth grade? No. Right, after genocide? <laughs> no, they, they taught me about mashing acorns. Right. Oh yeah, and then the, the American genocide chapter right. is next. It's next, kids. What your podcast does really well is it breaks down the individuals. So when you learn about it through that perspective, it seems like fiction, because that's the way that stories are told yeah. when they're written. Yeah. But you're telling a true story. You're telling, you're, you're talking about things that actually happen. Yeah, and we're talking to people, and the, it's just, you know, the podcast focuses on this one particular community and how are they dealing with reconciling the history of this of this school, Red Cloud Indian School, the fact that the, the Catholic Church and the school is investigating itself. Is that is that okay? Can they be objective? And there was also testimonials that there were children buried, murdered and buried or died there. And so what the podcast follows is we kind of go in and start to learn about the conflict that's brewing around this school and its own investigation. That's kind of what we start to track as the community gets ready for this ground penetrating radar, you know, um, demonstration and investigation. Mm. What are they going to find? And can you trust the, the, the church and the school to turn over the results? And what happens if they find children buried there? What happens if they don't? And we are really talking to all sides. And I think that's one of the things I'm really proud of. And I've heard a lot of people like loving the fact that you kind of, you get a lot of diverse personalities and a lot of different points of view. We're not just trying to sensationalize and paint right. one side of the story because it's complicated. I believe I'm immediately searching for American Genocide on all the podcast platforms. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that sounds, yeah. that sounds, that sounds wild. And it's, yeah. And this, but this was it's so, just... this was driven by the youth. What do you think that says about the youth going forward in, you know, making sure that, that Native American history is no longer erased? I think youth today, I am like constantly like, we are not putting up with this anymore. And you see young people more and more just like standing up, whether it's for native rights, for climate change, for LGBTQ rights, like you name it. And I think like we need our young people, but we can't just like be like, oh, the youth got it. Yeah. Right, at all, we all have to be accountable. But I see this energy now, this unapologetic energy with young people, like, no more. We're not gonna tolerate, you know, racism, discrimination, you know, against anyone. Mm -hmm. um, and that gives me a lot of hope. In your approach to discuss all these topics and educate people on the history and what's happening now, do you take an approach to make sure that it is informational and not making someone feel guilty? Or is that even a consideration? It's not really a consideration. I mean, I think we're really intentional about our language. You know, we're not trying to shame people out. And I think, you know, when we think about things like cancel culture and where some of the things gone, I think that has gone way too far. It's like, we really do things that kind of make people like it's feel like it's a safe place mm. and calling them in, but we're also straight shooters. And when we see if there's incidents of racism or wrongdoing, we're gonna, we're gonna call it what it is, mm. right? But then on the flip side, when we are doing that education or really just showing people all the beauty of contemporary native peoples and cultures and all the things, it, we just really invite everyone to be a part of it. And, and so it's not shaming people out, right? Mm -hmm. It's really like, talk about like calling them into the circle. By the way, this show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Oftentimes in life, we're faced with tough decisions and the path forward isn't always clear. So no matter the decision that you're dealing with, therapy helps you stay connected as you navigate life. And trusting yourself to make decisions that align with your values is like anything. The more you practice it, the easier it gets. As many of you know, I've been a huge proponent of therapy since I started going about six years ago which has been hugely helpful in me having empathy and understanding of my past self, which has then helped me understand my current self better. So if you've been thinking about therapy, BetterHelp might be the perfect fit for you. It's 100% online and designed to work around your schedule. All you have to do is fill out a brief questionnaire and you'll be matched with a certified and licensed therapist. Plus you can switch therapists at any time for no additional cost. Let therapy be a guide in your life with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash Padilla today and get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash Padilla for 10% off your first month. And this episode is also sponsored by Rocket Money. Most people think that they're spending about $80 a month on subscriptions when it's actually closer to $200 a month. And I am one of those people who realized that they were being charged for things I didn't even remember signing up for. Like, I guess I signed up for Spotify with two different emails and was getting double charged. 
Smart. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills all in one place. With Rocket Money, you can easily cancel your unwanted subscriptions with just a single press of a button. No more long hold times or annoying emails with customer service. Rocket Money can even help you negotiate to lower your bills by up to 20%. All you have to do is take a picture of your bill and Rocket Money takes care of the rest. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions and manage your money the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash Padilla. That's rocketmoney.com slash Padilla. And yes, I am going to say this just one more time. Rocketmoney.com slash Padilla. Now back to the world of indigenous people. What has the oppression of native culture done to communities? People don't know who we are. It's wrapped in myths and mythology and you know I mean if you like think you either think about Native Americans being like magical mystical and we can talk to animals and having a deep connection with the earth but right. on a spiritual not on a magical level. yeah on a magical level right or I can make it rain or, mm. or whatever or we're drunks we're you know hot mess we're like all of these things and we're just freeloaders we, we get free stuff and we don't pay for anything and it ends up fueling a lot of discrimination towards Native Americans and a lot of racism. And so that's why for the work we do at Illuminative, we are constantly fighting to disrupt and interrupt that erasure and be like, we are still here. This mm. is what's going on. This is what's happening on a myriad of issues or cool things that Native peoples are doing to constantly remind people that we're still here. And then we're constantly going after and trying to really like, you know, smash the, the false narratives, the stereotypes, or like really take on racist things like the Washington football team during 2020, during the pandemic, they used to have a really racist Was name. it? It was, which mm. is the equivalent of the N-word, right? I, I can't believe I just said that. Well, see, but you're learning now, and most people don't know that, but yeah. it is it is like a dictionary defined racial slur. Is that because it would be used as a slur to attack? Back in the day, in places like California, but across the country, the government, local governments, but federal government, the military would um, hire mercenaries to go out. They put bounties on Native Americans' heads. like men, women, children, different price amounts to go in and scalp them. And then as proof to in order to get you payment, you bring in the scalps and that's how you got paid. Oh my God. So that's where the name came to be. People for decades and decades and decades have been fighting with that football team, with the Washington football team and the NFL to change it. Can you imagine having the, the Washington N words? We just, we wouldn't tolerate it, right? It would not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, a, it's so outrageous to think right? that that would be a thing. But because of the erasure that's that's happened, it feels like the outside world uh, has kind of just seen it as a word that because they don't know or they don't, you know, they they don't have the attachment to the the negative side of it. They just see it as, you know, a caricature kind of idea. Yeah. They just they like don't. People, most people didn't know that there was harm behind it or yeah. that it was a bad word. I mean, yeah. and that's. It goes back to that erasure, that 80% of Americans not knowing anything about Native peoples, not knowing anything about Native history. And so most people were like, we don't understand what the problem is, right? What we found with like these sports mascots, you know, and some of these representations, like really nasty negative representations of Native people, right? That it actually increases anxiety, depression, and suicidal ideation amongst Native American youth. And we have the highest suicide rates of youth in this entire country. So it's just understanding that it's not like, oh, stop being so PC and a snowflake or whatever. It's really the science is behind it that it really does cause harm to our children. So is that part of the goal of Illuminative? Is that why you yeah. founded Illuminative? Yeah, completely. It was about, you know, building power or restoring balance, right? But it's really about centering contemporary Native peoples in this country to really advance justice and mm -hmm. equity you know, for our people and to really, you know, create those opportunities for our people to be seen and heard just like anyone else. And we do a lot of work in TV and film. Like we understand the power of media and imagery. So we do a lot of work in Hollywood and it's such a cool time because we have our first Native American TV shows now. They're killing it. They're doing great. They're winning awards. There's more Native films coming out. A lot is starting to change, mm -hmm. um, which is cool. One of the other missions is to reclaim Native truth. Yeah. Is that to teach the the truth of, of the Native history? Yeah, I mean, that's such a big part, you know, is really making sure that, you know, everything that people are being taught in school, a lot of it is just not accurate for any community, right? You're looking at who is writing these books and they're sanitized. And I think half of it ends up being this sort of propaganda that rationalizes 
sort of this colonial, like capitalist, like sort of mentality of how this, this country and this government wants to operate that really erases it and, and it flattens so many people in this country. And I think part of reclaiming that truth is like, this is what really happened, right? But this is also, the truth is also who we are today, right? And we are not defined just by the horrible things that happened to us as Native peoples. We're not a problem to be solved. We are badass, we're resilient. Like everything that Native peoples have managed to live through, through genocide, stolen land, stolen children, you know, racism, discrimination, like our people are still here. You have a heavy involvement in media. That's part of the way that you are contributing to, you know, keeping Native culture uh, thriving yeah. is is by getting these stories out there. You're a filmmaker and you created a film called Headdress. Can you tell us what that was about? The film revolves around uh, a person at a music festival dealing with a casual act of racism and how they respond to it. So what is it that they observe? Someone in a headdress. Someone in a yeah. headdress. <laughs> Which still happens today and still blows my mind. So tell me, tell me why that is not the uh, the right way to go about. No, um, if you saw hipsters, just started wearing yarmulkes at like, uh, you know, like or some sort of other religious garb uh, at a music festival. Mm -hmm. um, I never understood the correlation, and of course, a headdress is something that is uh, not just given away. You know, it's something that is earned, um, and to see like. You know, Sarah Beth at the concert, like rocking it in a bikini. It's like, what is this? I think I wrote it because it was. It's one of those things where it's like, I'm just, why does everyone look to me for the answer for some of these things? Colonization is messy and it's not black and white. Um, so, an answer to a lot of these things aren't, uh, yes, no, I mean, in case of headdress, rip it off. Yeah. But, um, I think also I just had this like apprehension and fear because I am not a confrontational person. And uh, like I said, at a young age, you have to learn to survive by being confrontational. Um, and I just wanted to sort of like honor the, the fact that like we're in a space now where we could talk about these things, where we could talk about the nuance and the insecurities around uh, confronting a situation like that. Was your film based on anything that actually happened in your life? I mean, I've seen so many people wearing headdresses at festivals or uh, my tribe is blah, blah, blah on a shirt. And it's like a margarita or something, mm. uh, you know, it's something that frustrates me because it's like, hi, hi, we're saying like, that's not cool. Like we're, we're telling you mm. um, and people are like, no, 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 but we're honoring you. Do you think the media is getting better at displaying Native American culture as what it really is in an accurate way? It is absolutely getting better. Um, and I think that's in part because of the rise of uh, native creators mm. and uh, people finally reaching these levels of uh, executive or uh, director and finally being able to tell these stories in authentic ways. Like I feel like like in the early 90s, there's this big native boom with uh, indie native films. Then it sort of went away. And then um, you, you come back now and there's this sort of like renaissance and I think it's in part because of native people, like I said, getting in power, like being in the positions of powers can help others um, and really showcase these stories, like I said, that aren't traumatic or super sad and like that were really funny people. I'm very grateful for where we are right now in terms of media because we're literally on the precipice of this like renaissance of showcasing the reality of it all because the reality is so much more interesting than what some exec in some Hollywood studio is uh, portraying us to be in like some cowboy Indian bullshit. You said, you know, the modern, the, the accurate portrayal is more interesting. What is that? I think the more accurate portrayal is when it's from the voice of an actual native person that's created the thing. Uh, it could be media that takes place in the past, uh, media that takes place in the future. I love indigenous futurism. And if you're curious about it, I mean, we have the internet. Like it's yeah. right there. Um, and. Like I said, we're on this precipice of like all this other cool native media coming out. So um, yeah, come hang out with us. How do you think people begin to experience healing? Do you think that it requires the research to be done and the, the evidence to be shown? Or do you think there's another element there that helps make people feel healed? I think for the people that are survivors, right? Um, to tell their truth. I think when we can first verbalize something that's happened to us. And you know, when we think about trauma or an injustice, when we can actually first verbalize it and give, give the power of story. Like for the podcast, we have elders that we interview that share 
their testimonies of abuse. And that helps and, with the healing. And I think for many of them, they've never talked about it before. They've yeah. repressed it. That's another form of healing, right? It's that truth. And I think, but it's also gonna be about accountability. The United States has to be, you know, government has to be accountable for this. These churches have to be held accountable because they made a lot of money. And there's a report that came out last May, a year ago, in which the federal government admits to all of this. The it's U.S. Huge, actually admits? United, the United States government admits to it. It's a full official report that was published Whoa. last year. And so that is like, that is huge. This isn't yeah. just like me like saying, we think this happened. The United yeah. States government has actually admitted to it. But then now the next level of investigation is like, they don't know what happened to, you know, tens of thousands of these kids. Mm. So that's, you know, the next part of healing is getting the accountability, the truth, the justice about whether it's bringing these kids home, it could be lamb back. I think it's gonna look like a lot of different things, but I think also it's about trying to reclaim our language and cultures in different communities. Like mine, where most people, we can't speak Pawnee, mm -hmm. right? Most of our ways are gone now because of these institutions. But I also think it's about mental health and it's about healing the trauma. It feels like a bleeding wound, mm -hmm. generational bleeding wound. And we have to recognize that we have to shine a light on it and we have to do a lot of resources because that level of trauma gets passed down over generations. What is it about doing what you do that brings you the most joy? I think my sort of MO right now is basically just be loud. Just be very loud in my identity, uh, be very loud in my just like, overall existence. Uh, create, I wanna create as many things as possible that um, help uplift uh, uh, native LGBTQIA to spirit, really to get over that hump of like, hey, we're here. Cause in my head, we're 18 steps ahead of that. Right. But I think the reality for a lot of people uh, in this country and in the world um, are sadly at that first step. There's this beautiful saying that, you know, Lakota people say, you know, the Lakota tribe, it's um, Mutakiyase, which means we are all related. And when you think about that for a minute, when you kind of step back for a minute and you think, if I have an attitude that we are all related, everybody that's in this room, I have a relationship with you. And I think that that's a common philosophy and a value that, that tribes have is that level of kind of connectedness and respect. We are all connected. Yeah. And if we treat everyone as if they are part of us, then that, that respect, that mutual respect there can, can really start the healing process. Yeah, and I think it's a value, it doesn't matter what, culture community come from like when we really just think about we are all related and if we start kind of shifting how we look at one another we look at the world the land all the things um it just it's that shift in consciousness and thinking about it, it's just a quality of life you know um that is is far better than sort of i think some of the the things that this country keeps pushing us towards right mm -hmm. this hyper crazy capitalism and sort of we get so caught up in the material things and all these things around us. Um, and it's just really about kind of stepping back and, and looking at our, our, our connections to one another and to ourselves. My aunt is one of the people that's revitalizing our traditional foods in our tribe and growing them and teaching our young people about how to, we were farmers. Didn't, it wasn't corn. Corn, it was corn was genetically like, modified and cultivated out of grass. Yeah. Well, I don't know about that. You'd have to, you'd have, we'd have to call my aunt about that part. <laughs> I, I went down a wiki hole. I went deep wow. into a wiki hole one day. And got, I, wanna, I, got stuck. Aunt I was like, I need to learn about maize. <laughs> <laughs> Where did it come from? Who invented it? 